Today we are facing some of the greatest challenges of our lives, from our health to political unrest, the environment, financial uncertainty, and the nation's racial divide. Welcome to Bill Myers Inspires. My idea for this show was to invite guests and get the conversation started, to take a deep dive into the issues that impact our world with an eye to exploring solutions. And we encourage our listeners to look within themselves to take decisive action to make a positive difference. Welcome to Bill Myers Inspires. I'm your host, Bill Myers. And um, today's show, um, there was actually a, a different show that was originally scheduled for today. And um, two days ago, I believe, what was that? Um, or three days ago, uh, Tuesday evening, I realized uh, near the early evening time that the day was May the 25th. And immediately I thought, okay, of course, this is the one year date since the killing of George Floyd. And I thought to myself, I need to surely address this in some way because it was that event that uh, was probably the greatest inspiration for me uh, starting uh, Bill Myers Inspires, the podcast. And and uh, entering into the dialogue uh, regarding social justice and racism in America. So um, I decided to make a very short post in the form of a simple meditation. And, on, uh, and, and the post read, pause, period, reflect, period. Rest in peace, Mr. George Floyd. Pretty simple. I had also a photograph of George Floyd and his daughter uh, as a picture that I offered up. And that was the extent of my intention was to just take a moment and honor George Floyd. And uh, little did I know what was what that would set off. And it was a series of comments um, that then, uh, came about as a result of that post and, uh, a significant series of comments and a significant series of perspectives and points of view that were also being shared. And so I, um, decided that the more urgent issue as far as the show that was going to take place this Friday was for me to switch gears and to create a show around that post um, and to examine the various perspectives and thoughts that were revealed in that post. So anyway, that, that is the story of today and, and how this show came about. Um, and today's, the title of the show is Pause, Period, Reflect, Period, George Floyd, One Year Later, with Dr. Winterborne Harrison Jones, who is my guest today. Um, so as I stated, I posted a simple meditation a couple of days ago on Facebook. And, um, you know, the comments and debate that followed inspired me to examine these comments more carefully uh, from my Facebook friends. Um, and while pondering, while looking at that, it also allowed me to ponder the question of where are we as individuals and a nation one year after George Floyd's murder? Um, and so let me tell you about my guest today who's going to join me in this uh, exploration. Uh, my guest today is Dr. Winterborne Harrison Jones. He is the senior pastor at Witherspoon Presbyterian Church here in Indianapolis, Indiana. Uh, the Reverend Dr. Winterborne Harrison Jones is a scholar and author, uh, ecclesial leader, and distinguished churchman of the lineage of Dr. William Augustus Jones, Dr. Uh, James Forbes, Dr. Mordecai Wyatt Johnson, the Reverend Marvin Chandler, and Dr. Howard Thurman. A fifth generation minister, Dr. Harrison Jones is widely sought after as a preacher, speaker, and workshop facilitator. 
Reverend Harrison Jones is a graduate of the historic Fisk University in Nashville, Tennessee, where he earned his bachelor's degree in religious and philosophical studies. While at Fisk University, Reverend Harrison Jones was mentored by the university's president and former United States Sec Secretary of Energy, the Honorable Hazel R. O'Leary, and the Dean of the Historic Fisk Memorial Chapel, the Reverend Dr. Jason Richard Curry. In addition to Fisk and Colgate Rochester Crozer Divinity School, Reverend Harrison Jones holds degrees and professional certifications from the Lilly Family School of Philanthropy, the Harvard University Graduate School of Education, the Hertie School of Governance in Berlin, Germany, the Universidad de Salamanca in Salamanca, Spain. I did take Spanish, so I can, I can navigate this one. Uh, Reverend Harrison Jones simultaneously matriculated in two national doctoral programs, earning the Doctor of Ministry from Colgate Rochester Crozer Divinity School and is currently pursuing a PhD in urban education from Indiana University, Purdue University at Indianapolis. As a scholar, Reverend Harrison Jones investigates how theological and homiletic resources within Christian traditions are valuable in interpreting and responding to such pressing public issues as economic deprivation, religious bigotry, racism, class inequity, and structural inequality. Please help me welcome my guest, and I'll take a breath, Dr. Winterborn Harrison Jones. Welcome today, Dr. It's Jones. So good to be here, Reverend Myers. And I will say that all of that just means we are good friends. <laughs> yeah, because for me to read all that, that's got to be some love in the room, man. <laughs> Glad to be. <laughs> So, you know, I, as, as you were coming on, I, I sort of set the stage regarding this post and uh, the evening of the one year date of, of George Floyd, Floyd's uh, murder. And I'm trying to come up with the right language because as you and I discussed briefly the other day, it's hard to use a word like anniversary. Yes. Because anniversary denotes some degree of celebration or celebratory tone. And I do not think that it is something to be celebrated. In fact, it, it represents, you know, one of the more shameful moments in American history. So there we have it. So, um, so I, we start off with a simple post. Uh, as I describe it, a meditation from my heart, which was pause, reflect, um, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble with my pad. Pause, reflect, rest in peace, Mr. George Floyd. And so in order for us to get into this, and, and I, I'm not going to go very far, but uh, the very first comment that came as a result of this post was the one that sort of tipped me in this direction to focus this show on this. And the comment was from a person a uh, Facebook friend, I, I suppose I don't have any shame since these statements were made publicly to go ahead and utilize the names uh, because they obviously felt comfortable enough to, to publish these statements. So the very first comment I got read, career criminal who committed suicide. I looked up and it was from a gentleman named John Burnett. I then clicked on John Burnett and, uh, discovered that we are indeed Facebook friends. So this was not someone who was outside of my friend circle. And as I scrolled down the page, I discovered that John Burnett is a retired Indianapolis Police Department officer. And that really uh, caught my attention for numerous reasons. And again, you know, as and, and the audience has heard numerous times that uh, I come from a law enforcement family. My father was on the Indianapolis Police Department for 54 years. My sister, youngest sister, is still serving on the Indianapolis Police Department coming up on her 30th year. So being in a law enforcement family and having certain sensitivities and respect uh, for the law enforcement community is, is certainly true if you are a cop kid uh, to, to uh a certain extent now, um, but this comment I just found to be 
uh, alarming, uh, foul in, 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 in many instances. Uh, with all due respect, that we all have the right to say what we say, but I also do believe that we have a responsibility for the words that we say, and we must take responsibility for the statements when we open our mouths and decide to speak on something. So I generally make it a practice to take a pause before I respond to anything so I can make a choice as to whether I should uh, remain silent here. So um, so that's where we are. So, I, so Dr. Jones, my thought here is very simple. I would like to know that um, one year later, after George Floyd's killing, uh, the post rang true in a couple of, uh, of ways because to look at it one year later, we would be to suggest that I, where have we come a year later? So, so it's natural to know that these comments that just arrived are comments from one year later which are clear indications of many different perspectives that still exist. Now, after the trial that was nationally televised uh, was, was wrapped up, uh, at least the trial as far as Derek Chauvin, uh, the trial for the other two or three officers is still yet to come, but the gentleman with the knee on the neck, the principal in this murder was def definitely Derek Chauvin. And so we have gone through the trial. We saw the outcome of that as he was convicted, found guilty by a jury of his peers on three counts that essentially were three murder counts, right? Uh, so for a law enforcement officer to speak to this, it is my thought that a law enforcement officer who is a law enforcement officer would also be respectful of due process and would be respectful of the findings of the court. And so therefore, I would think not only in the judgment that is exercised in the street to, to um, arrest, detain an individual um, and, uh, and uh, allege a, a charge at an individual, I would also think that it's it's not just that front end part of the justice process that a police officer, a sworn protector of the law and the rights of citizens to serve and protect the citizens of this nation. I don't think that it's just confined simply to, again, the detainment or arrest and then the charge being made. It also has to would seem to me that that officer also is obligated to stand by, right, the judgment of the court, because that's the other part of the system when that charge is, 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 is uh, contested in a courtroom. And the jury and the judge, they find this person guilty. For this person to be able to come out and say, you know, and, and create another narrative, uh, to suggest and, and to suggest career criminal uh, and he committed suicide is somehow implies very strongly that, you know, perhaps he was deservant of what he got. And again, there's a nine and a half minute video that, you know, shows us exactly why he was convicted of murder three times. I, I'm going to back up now and, and ask for your reflection that far. Uh, maybe I'm off base in my assessment of what I think our obligations are, whether it be a law enforcement officer or somebody who's sworn uh, to that level of service in our community. No, Billy, I think that you are exactly right. And I think that um, I think that the comments that were made on your Facebook post and continue to be made mm -hmm. are indicative of this 400 year old cancer of inhumanity, hatred, racism, as it pertains to indigenous peoples and black and brown bodies. To suggest that this is a moment to celebrate, I, I find that uh, we are in need of language to fully express what is happening in the hearts of a nation that continues to mourn and to grieve such heinous acts of inhumanity uh, 
only different from those experienced in 1619 by the uh, involvement of video cameras. But even in generations long ago, as we look at pictures of entire families and communities surrounding the lynching of black and brown bodies, murder and mayhem, the utter uh, and vehement, um, what do I want to say, uh, uh, disregard for constitution and as well as human life itself have always been public spectacles in this nation. So to suggest that somehow George Floyd, though uh, we mourn his death is, is separate from this 400 year sojourn is to, is to make a, a, a fitting and yet unworthy assessment or timeline, if you will, as to where this cancer first began. This 400 year old series of trauma and loss has always taken the breath out of the heart of the nation. Black men and women, indigenous peoples and people of African descent and indigenous to this, these lands before they were discovered or bumped into by Columbus and his lost team of explorers have always <laughs> had to bear the burden of the perennial sin of white supremacy in the nation. So what we see in that video, which I must admit, Reverend Myers, that I have not had the um, ability to watch in its totality. We see again and again, just this time with a different date signature, the same kind of activity that has always happened throughout this nation, the same kind of disregard, such that your moral argument, which is shouldn't one who um, takes oath be bound by that oath, is a moral argument, the same kind of moral arguments that Dr. King um, ushered to the nation, wherein he says the moral arc of the universe always bends towards justice. In this instance, that bending is slow because we've seen this time and time again. It's the same uh, moral predicament that caused Emmett Till to be murdered and body to be thrown in the Tallahassee River. It's the same moral predicament that caused us to rationalize the storming of the nation's capital as the government officials who were voted in by American citizens now refuse to create a bipartisan committee to explore that same type of breach of oath. Again and again, we have this perennial, um, uh, this perennial uh, expression of what's happened, what happens rather, when the moral core, when the moral arc, when the uh, the core values of who we are as a nation are eroded, co-opted, and are um, made to be something that uh, they ought not be for the benefit of some and for the um, disfranchisement of others. George Floyd's murder on public display, his 21st century lynching, which is what that was, is a chilling reminder that the soul of this nation is yet torn, that when it comes to racism, white supremacy, indifference, and the value of human life broadly, I don't really care if you put it white on white or black on black or brown on brown, the value of life and the fact that we now live in an age when even those who have sworn oaths to your point can at the same time in their minds, which is why Dr. King said that we are schizophrenic in our, in our, in our allegiance to flag and country, that at one time can be beholden to title, power, and uniform, but at the same time, disvalue the same lives that they took an oath sworn to protect and to defend. This is the cancer of this age. And one calendar year later, we are no further in many ways than we were in 1619, 1964, 1968. And to, and to try to find words, Reverend Myers, I am at a loss. It's just like to celebrate the birthday of Dr. King. I cannot separate that from the fact that he was murdered. To read the writings of Malcolm X is to remember likewise he was murdered. To honor uh, Anwar Sadat and the writings of those who fought for freedom across the world is at the same time to remember that they were martyrs and their lives were given and taken in a unjust way and by people who found no value in their lives at all. So when people wow. rationalize these arguments again and again, 
it shows that the very core of our nation is flawed. Our fundamental understanding of what the fabric of community is has been eroded and is in crisis. Wow. Yeah, it 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 it's it is very uh, um, very evident that that something is terribly wrong in 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 the foundation uh, of 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 these processes and thought processes uh, and and how we're able to to hold these thoughts. We're going to take a break really uh, at this time, and um, again today we are. Uh, with my special guest, Dr. Winterborn Harrison Jones, and we're discussing pause, reflect, rest in peace. George Floyd was the post, the, the meditation that I offered, and that is the subject of today's show. You're looking and listening to Bill Myers Inspires right here on the Inspired Choices Network. We'll be right back in just a moment. Today, we are facing some of the greatest challenges of our lives. From our health to political unrest, the environment, financial uncertainty, and the nation's racial divide. Tune in every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Bill Myers Inspires as he and his guests take a deep dive into the issues that impact our world with an eye to exploring solutions. Emmy Award winning actor Bill Myers is an accomplished actor, jazz musician, filmmaker, writer, educator, and speaker. As a biracial man who's both black and white, Bill leverages his background, talent, and voice through creativity, compassion, and connection as activism for social justice to focus on uniting the divide and compelling change. Bill Myers Inspires encourages listeners to look within themselves and take decisive action to make a positive difference. For more information, visit his website, BillMyersInspires.com, and sign in for the latest news and updates. Are you a subject matter expert? Are you here to share your expertise with an audience waiting to hear from you in only the way you can deliver? Are you ready to have your voice amplified across the airwaves? Inspired Choices Network has a global radio platform streaming to millions of people across the world. Professionally produced and supported by an accomplished team every step of the way, you can broadcast from anywhere in the world knowing your voice matters and we ensure it is delivered with ease and efficiency. Eager to hear your message, the world awaits. Contact us today to become an Inspired Choices Network radio host. Email become a host at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. You're listening to Bill Myers Inspires here on the Inspired Choices Network. We're here every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you for joining us. And now, let's get back to the conversation. We're back. You are listening to Bill Myers Inspires, and today the topic of our show is pause, reflect. George Floyd, one year later, with my guest, Dr. Winterborn Harrison Jones. Uh, you know, as as we were just coming back to break, uh, something just just crossed my mind, and it was not only is a police officer, you know, charged with upholding the law, it it also I believe is an obligation to uphold the verdict part of it as well and to respect that part of the process. Because to me, it would seem disjointed uh, to have a legal system where police can make the, the allegation, the prosecution part of it and the, the, the trial part of it takes place and the policeman is, in, is out of kilter or imbalanced or dishonoring of what that outcome is. I don't know how you can how you can respect one part of the law and not the other part of the law. And I don't know if your oath is just obligated to, you know, just make allegations against people, <laughs> but not honor the second part of that, the due process part of that. Um, uh, so anyway, I, I, I'm just very curious about that. I don't, I don't want to so, sort of stay stuck on that, but let me advance this just a little bit because um, of course a comment like that, 
was um, immediately, re- you know, I, I felt the need to to address it. And I, I don't usually engage in a bunch of jousting on Facebook and a bunch of opinion stuff sort of back and forth. But I did find it necessary to let my other friends know uh, from whence that comment came. And it needed to be known that that came out of a police officer, a uh, retired police officer, which um, so, of course, people really pounced on that. And I and I, you know, I, I did what I did. I don't uh, unapologetically. I offered up uh, that he was a police officer. Um, and of course, you know, people responded and, you know, John, you know, uh, you know, at what point this morning did you wake up and decide that you would just be a grumpy and hateful old man? One comment, what a horrible soul you must inhabit. Wait, maybe you're referring to Derek Chauvin as the career criminal, you know, so on and so forth. But people really did respond to this. Um, a jury of his peers unanimously disagree with you. They were highly informed of the details of the event, whereas you are ignorant of them in comparison, you fail. Um, you know, so these are some of the feedbacks, but then there's this, this one that came in from Charlene Lakin, who is a good friend of mine. And she said, Bill, that was a typical answer from too many, but not the majority, I hope. Actually, he is the typical cop on the street. Just my opinion, of course. Charlene Lakin is, is you know, a, a lovely uh, woman, uh, senior, and, and she is white. I think it's necessary to say. So again, I, I wanna, I'm, I'm giving a sort of brief profile on the individual speaking up because I think that that's necessary in order to have a context. Who is that? Is that a young person, older person? Um, where is this feedback coming in? Um, now, following that comment, and then we'll get back to discussion here, is, is uh, Clarence Lonnie White. Clarence White is a uh, retired. He, he's retired uh, a few years ago. He was, uh, uh, you know, on, on Indianapolis Police Department. He comes from a law enforcement family. His, his you know, father and brother, I mean, there were many that were uh, uh, police officers. And Clarence, and, and Clarence is a person of color. So Clarence offered this up. He said, John is a retired officer, IMPD, as am I. However, all officers do not agree with John's assessment. Whomever law enforcement deals with, each and every one is a human. I've dealt with a similar situation like George Floyd and realized that the individual was under stress and took the proper steps. The individual lived. I believe any officer should be able to determine a problem. Discuss. To your point, what this other officer um, is getting at is that these oaths and these roles and responsibilities that people have, Reverend Myers, cannot be separated from their character as human beings more fully. A person who fundamentally does not value the life of another human being, there is no oath that can supersede that sort of core um, chasm in their, in their hearts. What this other officer is saying is, while I too am a police officer, I am built differently. My humanity is constructed differently. My core values, how I assess, and what I value, what I deem as important. I am not tied to propaganda or empty narrative. I'm tied to doing what's right. The challenge that we have here, Ribbon Myers, is that we are now living in an age where oath and credo are dismissible, where people can wear the badge or wear the clergy robe but not the tradition, the, the, the core values, the high regard that come with them. Someone now can smile and shoot or be a constitutionalist and still be a racist or, uh, or believe in the uh, love of God, but not an equality of all human beings. What we now have to do is reestablish who we are as a nation, who we are as people. What is the value of human life? 
How might we live and thrive? What is our uh, obligation to one another? How might we survive together? What will we do? To what are we true? To what do we lend our heart? This conversation we are having today is similar to the conversation that the gentlemen had at the founding of the nation, where they carved out the core values of this land of which you and I would not have been counted to be a part. We are now at yet another defining moment in this nation. George Floyd um, was another reminder that we have not yet dealt with at all since the inception of this nation. What does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be owed the right to live, to thrive? And if we profess that we believe that every human being life matters, black, brown, blue, green, multicolored, polka dot makes no difference. Then the next piece of this is how might we enact our agency to build the world that we profess to believe in? A year later, many things have changed. I believe that the leadership of our nation is in a better place. I believe that the uh, legal system has dealt a minor blow, though a fitting blow, a deserving blow to this long cycle of acquittals with people who have continuously broke the law, violated life, and murdered black and brown defenseless men and women. But what still is yet to be discussed or seen or yet to be experienced is how does that show up in everyday interaction? What does it mean to develop a system, a community, a set of beliefs whereby we are again nourishing the human spirit where the soul of every person matters and where we are building communities where people can thrive and experience the fullness of life itself. And that officer is getting at the fact that the character of a person is not bound to or is not fully represented by the oath they take or the badge they wear. Mm. Wow, that's a, you know, I was just thinking about the idea of, and, and not to, to at all feed into the, the notion of a George Floyd and his previous run-ins with the law, but to suggest the idea that, um, you know, this is something that has always disturbed me, is, and that is when an individual is found guilty and is convicted of a crime and does their bid, they, they, they go to prison and they do their, their time, how they should, you know, their representation as far as being released should be, you know, an opportunity to get it right the next time. But if we as individuals or as a society Always look at a person and only remark or find, you know, when we look at them, them on their worst day. You know what I mean? And that's all we do is constantly. So you will you will always be a convict. You will always be a criminal because you did a crime, you know, and I just that that has always disturbed me because, again, they they played by the rules from the standpoint that they they were found guilty, did their time. And we need to take them from that point to the next point instead. And, you know, and, and again, I, I'm sure this happens with a lot of people, but, you know, where it's noticeable to me is, of course, the burden that is, you know, forever present, the tattoo that happens, particularly with people of color. Once a criminal, always a criminal. Once an animal, always an animal. Once a da 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 da. Those just seem to be very convenient. And those, those labels throughout time. Uh, can just roll off the tongue because systematically what we're looking at are black people that and, and from a standpoint of a dehumanization. So we will find whatever justification, you know, he, he's got big, you know, big buggy eyes and can't be trusted. It's like, wait a minute, what do you mean by that? Now, this is somebody who's not even a criminal, but I've already criminalized him and characterized him in such a way that creates a negative so now I'm just watching more carefully because if he jaywalks, you know, or he does anything, see, I told you. Does that make sense? I, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm floating out there, but I just, I'm really bothered by how we, we, we so easily today use situational ethics because some of the biggest criminals that in, in, in recent history actually hold public office. Um, and, 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 and I say that 
wholeheartedly because there is no way that they are you know, the closest to the Constitution and the protectors and are engaged in activities that have nothing to do with serving the people, but a narrow group of people and a narrow agenda. And to me, there's nothing more criminal because they're hijacking an entire society. While we watch some drama in Washington, D.C. play out, you know, uh, you know, I don't know. Yeah, let me... I think what you're speaking of, Reverend Myers, and I think this is perfect, is this, this double standard. And you are right. It is, it is There is a huge chasm between what we saw in January at the Capitol and, and how uh, the same individual who enacted those riots had responded to the cries for justice in the streets. This victimization, this cannibalization, this dehumanization is exactly the American predicament at this time. That again, we are now living in an age where those uh, who have been sworn to protect the Constitution and the people of this nation act with the same, uh, act by rather, the same ethics of guerrilla warfare, inhumanity, and uh, indifference as they then project on those who are ultimately, in the words of, I forget who it was that said that protest is the is the voice of those who feel as though they are unheard. I don't know who said that, but but I am I am uh, poorly paraphrasing. But the idea is that through through media dogma and a loss of a moral ethic, this double standard has prevailed. And so again and again, while I do honor the the verdict that has been dealt in the in the case as it pertains to George Floyd, we still have a four hundred year legacy to deal with, to grapple with. And then what about the other issues, reform and uh, police training and community trust? I mean, as much as I watched the trial, I could not believe fully that the outcome would change what I know to be true every single day. Again, we must rechart a different way. We must again define who we are as a nation, who we are as a people. What does it mean to be American? And to what are we loyal? And to what are we true? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm going to go and share with you a, 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 this, this next comment was um, uh, from uh, Kelly Vaughn. Kelly Vaughn is a longtime uh, uh, media uh, uh, personality and, and producer and and has been on radio and television for many, many years. Kelly says, even career criminals deserve a fair trial. By the way, you are welcome. And she, then she opens up. You're welcome to come on our community affairs show to express your sentiments. This, of course, was geared toward to, to uh, John that made the initial comment. Um, again, sort of inviting him. Now, at this particular point, we're 60-some we're comments into this post. Uh, <laughs> and... Um, at that point, there was no comment at all uh, from uh, the uh, retired police officer who made the initial uh, statement here. So, um, so you know, I think that there is much to be said. Um, there was uh, Clarence White, who was the black officer who had responded uh, to to John uh, John's comment a minute ago. Um, someone commented about about his statement and said, I, you know, and this is a black gentleman who's a, a music producer. And he says, I like that sentiment. However, I would suggest that police abide by it also when dealing with different ethnicity. In other words, um, the idea of that humanity and that extension uh, of, of assistance when someone is distressed and, uh, and and if it's a person of a different ethnicity. So he's zeroing in on the the, the, the color card here and uh, Clarence responds back to him and said, Michael, I could be wrong, but I have the impression you paint all law enforcement officers as bad. Finding a group bad is not different than those individuals who find any group as a whole bad. All must stop painting with a broad brush. Police abide by, by it also when dealing with different ethnicities. So you know all police, you know, uh, 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 you know, don't you? So he's sort of, sort of bringing that back. In other words, all policemen are not the same because we are human beings, and I think that 
that somewhere in there, it's unfortunate that we don't connect the role and the responsibility of a police officer. We don't connect it to, uh, uh, I guess, a criteria is not necessary for you to be a decent or <laughs> human being, uh, which I think should be factored in to anybody who's going to be charged with protecting and serving people or, or you know, protecting the store at, in the middle of midnight. I mean, I, I think w- a, a prerequisite should have something to do with our humanity, w- one would think. <laughs> so anyway, when we come back, we're, we're going to take another break right now. And you are listening to Bill Myers Inspires. And today we're talking about pause, reflect. George Floyd, one year later. We'll be back in just a moment. Today, we are facing some of the greatest challenges of our lives. From our health to political unrest, the environment, financial uncertainty, and the nation's racial divide. Tune in every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Bill Myers Inspires as he and his guests take a deep dive into the issues that impact our world with an eye to exploring solutions. Emmy Award-winning actor Bill Myers is an accomplished actor, jazz musician, filmmaker, writer, educator, and speaker. As a biracial man who's both black and white, Bill leverages his background, talent, and voice through creativity, compassion, and connection as activism for social justice to focus on uniting the divide and compelling change. Bill Myers Inspires encourages listeners to look within themselves and take decisive action to make a positive difference. For more information, visit his website, BillMyersInspires.com, and sign in for the latest news and updates. How wonderful would it be to carry your favorite Inspired Choices Network host with you throughout your day? Well, now you can. Inspired Choices Network now has its very own mobile app. Our free app offers live streaming shows along with thousands of podcasts and TV episodes. Our shows cover a wide variety of topics. Whether you're waking up with us, carrying us through the day, and taking us to bed with you, we're always here for you to enjoy. We're easy to find. Just search for Inspired Choices Network in the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. You're listening to Bill Myers Inspires here on the Inspired Choices Network. We're here every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thank you for joining us. And now, let's get back to the conversation. We are back, and you're listening to Bill Myers Inspires. I'm your host, Bill Myers, and today I'm here with my special guest, Dr. Winterborn Harrison Jones, pastor of Witherspoon Presbyterian Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. And we are discussing pause, reflect, George Floyd one year later. So, Dr. Jones, I'm going to to uh, invite you in now to 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 have a go. I know I'm sort of randomly pulling some of the comments. Of course, you know, there are many people who are really perturbed with the statements that were made. And then there were other people who, you know what I mean? So we have these various perspectives, but the ones that involve law enforcement officers were the most telling to me. And that, that created its own uprising, I I believe within my Facebook friends. And, uh, but uh, I'm going to now let you come on in and reflect on what, what I had just shared and, and, um, I guess the notion is, you know, now that we we know that these posts represent sort of a a uh, a sample, if you will, of where we are a year later. I think then what is necessary is uh, what does all that mean, and 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 what uh, what what work have we still to do in order to get where we want to go. <laughs> equality justice humanity in the in the johannan text uh if i may lift from the sacred uh for a moment 
in Revelation, I believe it's chapter 25, I am not sure, but I do know that we find a writing from John at this point in his ministry being um, exiled to the island of Patmos because of his convictions. He writes these words, he says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth and the old heaven and the old earth were passed away. He then goes on to sort of give poetic alliteration to the vision that he received from God. But again, I draw us back, Reverend Myers, to this idea that we must now chart a new way to salvage that which never worked or to believe that we can reform a system that was intentionally built to be broken or that in some way, if you add enough band-aids, you can cover the entire sore or if you um, somehow add enough putty to a wall that the fundamental material that it was made by will not continue to, made with rather, will not continue to seep through. The system is working exactly the way the system was designed to work. It is protecting the powerful and it is marginalizing and victimizing those who it perceives to be of no value. The government officials today who block the bipartisan um, uh, commission to investigate the uh, assault on the United States Capitol took an oath to protect the Constitution. We keep making moral arguments suggesting that they're not doing their job. I would argue that they are doing the exact job that they took an oath to do because it's about how they interpret the Constitution. It very well may be that same version that talked about we as African Americans being three fifths of a person. It may be the same version that gave credence and gave um, legal aid to those who could take the life of others without being tried. See, all of these amendments suggest that the original um, document was flawed, so we had to continue to amend. What we now need to do is to cease amending and go to the source. The system is broken. We must now construct a new vision. And that is what I am hopeful of uh, as a faith leader now a year later. But it's the same vision that my forefathers and foremothers and yours too, Billy, were faithful mm -hmm. of, that we in a new way can pick up the shard pieces of our moral um, rags that we can dust ourselves off and that we may be able to lift again some banner of decency and honor. Langston Hughes has a piece, if I may take liberty, Reverend Myers, and sure. I may, I may uh, misquote it. I believe I know it by heart. I jotted down a few of the words, but it's called I Dream a World. Langston Hughes writes these words. He says, I dream a world where man no other will scorn, where love will bless the earth and peace its path adorn. I dream a world where all will know sweet freedom's way, where greed no longer saps the soul, nor arrogant blights our way. A world I dream where black or white, whatever race you be, will share the bounties of the earth and every man is free, where wretchedness will hang its head and joy like a pearl attends the needs of all mankind of such I dream my world. This is what is needed now, a new prophetic vision, a new uh, language, a new way of being, a new ideal, a new way. And it's going to come from people like you, River Myers, who convene these kind of conversations, uh, thankful to the network, but thankful to you who continue to help the nation and your listeners carve out some sort of moral clarity. Week after week, I I follow your work and you have had tremendous speakers, actually, I would argue an array of talented leaders, unlike many platforms, both large and small, but your commitment to the moral authority of brotherhood and sisterhood, the fabric of community is what I've always appreciated. That's what we must do now. We must now take whatever ravishing uh, shards of our broken humanity and weld a new sword by which we can go into battle and create something more prosperous. Well, I thank you for that. I thank you for offering up that piece. Uh, uh, you said Langston Hughes. I want. I'm going to make sure and. Dream a world. Okay, um, I definitely want to uh, have a copy of that. That is beautiful and uh, and 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 quite powerful. Uh, so, 
Um, and I thank you for acknowledgement of the work that I have uh, uh, tried to do every every week. So it's it's nice to know that it is landed and someone can see it for 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 what it is. I, I want to have one more stab at this because it's it's really interesting. This particular comment came in uh, yesterday evening, and this is for from a younger. Uh, African American officer, meaning he's not retired. He's you know been on probably you know between five ten years or whatever. Um, his name is Ethan Edward, and so I just want to offer why he, what he says here and and get a reflection on that because I think that there's there's something between the older guys and the younger guys, but this is an African American. Uh, gentlemen, why is he hateful for holding a black man responsible for his actions? He didn't say he agreed with the officer's decision to place a knee on George Floyd's neck. He was merely saying George was a criminal, high on drugs. We need to hold our black men responsible for their actions to have change, point blank, period. Now, this is from a black police officer who is suggesting that, you know, that John, the original retired white officer, that his comments were not hateful and, and is finding some agreement with the perspective that John was holding. And his point being, we need to hold our black men responsible for their actions. I, I don't know what actions happened once he had a knee on his neck. I watched nine minutes and I didn't really see much of a fight. So I, I'm the, anyway. the challenge that the 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 reality that all assailants are not of the opposite race. Again, this sort of apologetic sort of rationalization, there is nothing that justified the murder of George Floyd. Not the what some may would have suggested the counterfeit bill, the initial call. Nothing that transpired that day warranted the public murder of another human being at the hands of another human being. It did not have to end that way. Any argument that tries to in any way to rationalize this outcome is flawed. It's flawed by nature, it's flawed ethically, it's flawed morally. Certainly we do have to hold each of us accountable, whether you're black or white, but accountability is held within context where there is not a unusual abuse of power there was nothing Mr. Floyd could have done to alleviate outside of crying as he did and calling for his mother. What, show, what the officer did that day was to take ultimate power of God into his hands, to steal the life, to rob the world of a life, to steal a father, a son, a lover, a man, a community member, who yes, may have had in his challenges, but do those challenges devalue his life to the extent that he should die on the pavement by with someone else's knee on his neck? And that answer is no. And anyone who tries to make a moral or, or a justifiable argument uh, counter to that uh, may be just as cancerous as the officer at the center of this, of this trial and his comrades uh, as well. See, the system is flawed. The cancer has pervaded our minds such that we can even begin to forge some sort of justifiable argument uh, um, in defense of this activity. A year later, we pause and we reflect, but we are also reminded that we have many more years to go. And until we fix this problem, reform it, hold our officers, community members, and government officials accountable, and likewise rebuild our moral center as a nation, then we will be here many more one years into the future. Yeah, that's, it's something, you know, uh, I am, uh, well, I'm grateful to have you here, Dr. Jones, uh, joining me in this important conversation. We're going to get out of here right now. You've been listening to Bill Myers Inspires. Uh, thank you. And we'll see you next week. Thank you for spending your afternoon right here with us at Bill Myers Inspires. Remember, we're here every Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the Inspired Choices Network. Remember to take time this week to take a breath, 
and look within yourself and figure out how you can make a positive difference in this world. Spread the word, and we'll see you here next Friday. Have a wonderful week.